The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, Pastor Lisa was right. Though, when I was young, I liked to build and make things. I, I, I still think it's a fun thing to do. And when I was young, we had plenty of different toys that you could build and make things out of. I don't know if you remember the old American brick sets with all those red brick pieces that interconnect. And of course, Lincoln Logs are still around. I'm glad to see that with their wooden pieces to build log cabins. But in my day, the American brick sets and the Lincoln Logs and the other toy sets, just they had a certain number of basic pieces, you know? And the pieces were standardized enough that you could, you could design your own homes or cabins or whatever you could think of. But as you know, Legos and others have brought around a revolution in toy building sets. Today they come with little figures and special parts so that a kit that is meant to build a Star Wars ship cannot also build Hogwarts Castle. And you really need those instructions with those expensive $400 kits, or otherwise it's useless, because you're not dealing with the basic building blocks I remember with my American brick set. We here are starting a new year as far as our church is concerned. Next Sunday, we will have our annual meeting. Soon ministry teams will reorganize and set about another year of planning. But this year is a little different. In fact, all our lives are a little different this year. Last year we were more in a, an adaptive and just keep the basics going mode in the face of a new pandemic. Now we are coming up on two years into pandemic and wondering if we will finally get back to normal. But one thing that we have learned in both our personal lives and our life as church together is that our society will likely not go totally back to the way it was before. The American workplace has partially moved to remote work and more flexible hours and fewer days in the traditional office. Shopping has moved largely online and away from brick and mortar stores. And restaurants will forever have a large part of their business probably as takeout and delivery. And we look at our lives we may not know how the blocks go together anymore. We have a lot of pieces, and many look familiar, but how to make them go together and what the final product will look like may be harder to understand anymore. Today, we heard Paul's words for the Corinthian church, where he talks about how we are all one as Christians it's a passage most of us are familiar with. We are all baptized into one body of the Christ, the church. We all drink of one spirit. We have many members but are one. In fact, the word one shows up ten times in our short passage. But the Corinthian church has come down to us as famous through the ages for their conflicts, infighting, and differences. We are told that for communion, they came together for one big meal, but everyone brought their own food and drink, and the rich sat sort of in the VIP section with tables loaded with delicacy, while the poor sat in the back with barely enough to eat. 
And we are told that those who got prophecies and could heal people maybe acted more holier than thou over others who were maybe only contributing by doing basic jobs and serving. We are told they couldn't agree on who they were following and even fought over what to believe. I think that even the churches that struggle the most with conflict today are thankfully not as bad off as that Corinthian church. But for all churches, we can learn from the principles that Paul was talking about as we go about being church together. And as we go about fighting, uh, figuring out how to make decisions about our personal lives. There are many times that I have wished that God gave us a packaged, modern, fancy Lego set that had the finished picture on the front and the step-by-step -step instructions inside. Not only does life often seem like we are missing the instruction booklet, but that the pieces can't possibly have a way to go together. And coming out of this pandemic in many ways has felt to me like we have the pieces not only of just a Lego set, but the Lincoln Logs and the Connects all thrown together in a pile. But God is telling us in Corinthians that we really do have all the pieces necessary to do what God is calling us to do. And that for our personal lives, God has promised that we really have what we need to be what God wants us to be. When Jesus comes to his hometown to preach, they were hoping for some great insights or splashy miracles or something big like they heard about he was doing elsewhere. But Jesus just opens to the spot in Isaiah where God has promised to bring about God's future kingdom of justice and well-being and then announces that the promises of God are now fulfilled in him. I'm sure if I'd been in that audience, I might have laughed. I mean, the Romans were still oppressing the Israelites. The religious leaders were tightly cozied up to them. The taxes were oppressive and just helped the Romans oppress you more. Economics weren't the greatest either because more and more people were slipping from a comfortable way of life down to being poor and needy. And a few healings and great preaching by our local carpenter's son has now fulfilled God's promises to Israel? Laughable! Jesus is surely thinking way too highly of himself, and it just doesn't fit the way things look today. Then take Paul. He's looking at a deeply conflicted and divided church with fights over leadership and immorality within it and saying, hey, God's made all of you a part of each other, and you have all the parts given you to do God's work. Paul was probably the only one that thought that the Corinthian church could make it. Today, we'd probably call the synod and the bishop and wait for it to be closed down. But Paul knew that it was God who had formed the pieces of the body and given gifts to the various parts so that the whole could do what God intended. And Paul trusted that God had appointed and empowered the many members to do what would be necessary. And Jesus announced the audacious news that merely the hearing of his words was equivalent to the fulfilling of God's plans. That in the understanding, the hope, the power of his words among people's hearts, that would bring completion of God's better way of living. We are no different than the audience of Jesus' day in his hometown that Sabbath. In the act of our hearing and understanding Jesus' words lies the completion of God's plans for a new community of God. And we aren't much different either than the Corinthian church. No matter how ill-equipped, tired out, disillusioned, or lacking we are, somehow God appointed this assemblage here of people for God's work. And even if in your life, you feel that you don't have what you need to be what you want, or you have messed up things so that the future is problematic, or others have damaged your life beyond repair, or that losses make it hard to go on. To you also today, God says, in your hearing, the promise of God's coming healing and restoration and justice, God's plan is fulfilled in your life. But how can words, just words, accomplish so much?
Because words have hope and vision and meaning within them. Because words can heal and give purpose and provide strength. If motivational speakers can make so much money and propel individuals to higher heights, and if coaches can inspire teams to accomplish more than their combined talents would allow, and if sharing stories can bring people of vastly different cultures together, if words of love can get us through the hard times, how much more can God's words do amazing thing among God's people and in the lives of believers? God's building set is obviously a little different than toy building sets. The instruction set often doesn't come with every step lined out so you can look ahead. And the parts often look like they don't go together. Maybe the hardest thing we face as Christians is that God doesn't line out our every best move and give us the directions in advance. In fact, maybe there isn't even one best move or only one way to put the pieces together. Maybe it's better that the pieces all don't look the same and that they have unique characteristics and different ideas. We like to think that things are easier if all the pieces are standardized and can go together in multiple different ways. Lincoln logs all fit together because they're all made with the same notches. But what if it's better that these pieces of our lives, or we as pieces in church, are so very different? What if that's a clue? What if that's part of the power of what God is doing and not a defect? A clue lies in the fact that Paul tells us, remember, every piece is important and you have it for a reason. And the clue lies in the fact that God promises to give us what we need to do what God intends. And maybe the pile has more potential than we think. So as we stare this morning at the pile of parts we have for life as church together, or we stare at the pile of options we have to build our own lives, we know that this pile is enough and the pieces must have some place to go. And we are given the promise as we build and try things out that the power is not in the pieces, but in the words, the person that holds them together, who is Christ. The pieces by themselves are probably inadequate. We are all broken, a little misshapen, or oddly made. But we shouldn't think that the pieces are limited by how many parts we have or how good each part is. We must remember that if a motivational speaker by a business guru, if that can inspire people, or a pep talk from a coach can move people to do more than they thought capable, surely God's words are even more powerful than a Tony Robbins or a Joe Madden. We may start each day standing before a pile of pieces, wondering what will fit together today. And we as a church will surely always struggle with how we use the pieces we have and what we are to build with them. But we have these words of Jesus. Today, in your hearing, God's promises are fulfilled. And what about the missing picture of what everything should look like when we're finished? Well, we're only given one picture of the completed project. We are all jumbled together in a box of parts, but it has one face on the front, and that is Jesus. Amen. Our, today, as we consider how we are joined together for God's mission in the world, is number 